Welcome to the second part of our joint webinar. My name is Thorsten Remmler and I would like to show you in this practical session how to measure a shear viscosity curve of a battery slurry uh, with our Kinexus rotational rheometer. The first thing you need to answer before you start a measurement is which geometry is the best to use. We have cone plate, plate plate and cup and bob geometries. The most accurate is the cone plate geometry, but it has a very, very tiny, narrow gap at the front of this uh, cone. And so our maximum particle size of the battery slurry should be at least 10 times smaller than the gap size of the cone. I will use for this demo a cone with 4 degree cone angle and 40 millimeter diameter. And so we assume that our particle size, our maximum particle size in the slurry is less than 15 microns because our target gap for the cone is 150 micrometers. So our temperature control system can be opened. And now I will start our loading procedure in the software to bring the sample into the rheometer. We will be prompted to insert the upper cone. This is done by a quick connection system. The Kinexus reads automatically which cone is inserted and I will be prompted to confirm that I use this geometry. Next thing is I need to initialize the geometry. You see the hood is detected. We need to open to a zero the upper cone onto the lower pedestal plate. And by pushing the OK button, this will be done now. We are using our actual normal force control to initialize. This normal force control can also be very useful to measure the elastic response of our material under shear flow, which we will see afterwards in our measurement. So now the upper cone is driving up to a loading position. Before I load the sample, I will now give in the sample name. I call it slurry one. And the software now prompts you to load a defined sample volume. I take the sample and apply it with a spatula onto the lower plate. We are having a demo sample at the moment because for health and safety reason, we cannot measure real battery slurries but it shows a similar behavior like your battery slurry. So I put approximately the correct sample volume onto the lower plate. And now I drive down with the upper cone to a trim gap, which is slightly higher than our target gap of 150 micrometers for this cone, because we need now to take off the excess of material to have a proper filling proper sample loading. You see now the sample is getting out of the upper cone, flowing down uh, at the edge of the lower pedestal. And I can take now the spatula and take the excess of material off. This is very important because the trimming is still the largest error introduced by the user on a shear viscosity measurement. After you have trimmed, we go down to the target gap of our cone by confirming. And you see now in the software screen that we are monitoring the full history of our sample, which forces are acting at which times the pre-shear history uh, can affect the results. So therefore, this is fully monitored on the Kinexus and can later be stored and analyzed. So the last point in my loading sequence is to close the temperature control. In this case, it's the upper hood. So the sample will now be heated and cooled from the bottom, from the top, left and right. So we have no temperature gradients across our sample because viscosity can be very, very strongly influenced by temperature. So we close our loading procedure. Now we can start a test and I would like to do this as a steady state flow curve. That means we are running a table of shear rates. 
So we control the speed of the flow of our battery slurry and we choose the shear rates according to the process, blade coating, slot die coating, and we can calculate these shear rates according to the formulas given in uh, part one of this webinar. So I will measure at the moment at 25 degrees C and I will use a mid range of shear rates from one to 100 reciprocal seconds, typically for blade coating. And I will do 10 steps of shear rate per decade. Now we are starting our thermal and mechanical equilibrium phase for the slurry. So you see the normal force being slightly negative around zero. This is because of the surface tension acting on the edge of the sample, trying to drag the upper cone down, but it's quite well in equilibrium and our temperature is close to 25 better than 0.1 degree C. And so we can just skip at this stage and start the measurement. And now we can see from our live tab what the instrument is doing at the moment. It applies the shear rate to the sample by applying a certain angular speed to the upper cone. And our motor drive is measuring the torque from the angular speed and the geometry factor of the cone, we can calculate the shear rate. This is what we apply. And from the torque and the surface area of the cone, we can calculate the shear stress. You see in the live tab, the red curve is the live shear rate being applied in steps, starting from one, going up to 100 reciprocal seconds. And the blue curve is the response of the material, it's the shear stress. How much force do we need to get the sample into the flow with a certain speed? The software automatically waits as long as needed to reach time independent flow. We call this steady state. And this steady state is a mathematical derivative which uh, gets equal to one independent on the sample, independent on the viscosity function. It's a universal function, so we can see how accurate we are measuring. And you see from the actual state that we have approached the steady state accuracy already. Then an integration time of 10 seconds is averaged before we get the data analyzed. So software calculates the ratio between the stress and the shear rate, and that gives us our shear viscosity curve. And we can monitor this in our final results tab. You see a blue curve. This is the dynamic shear viscosity of our material versus the shear rate on the x-axis. So we are moving from small speeds to larger speeds, and our shear viscosity is nearly constant. We call this a zero shear viscosity plateau. That means if you process the slurry very, very slowly, you see a very high but constant flow resistance, which does not change by changing the speed. And each of these points is taken in equilibrium, in time independent condition. It's very important because the shear viscosity curve of the slurry can be dependent on the shear rate, but also on the time. And we measure just the steady state time independent flow curve, which is the usual case in the process. You have time independent processing conditions. Now, while we are approaching higher and higher shear rates, you see that the shear viscosity function is dropping. We see a decrease in shear viscosity, the higher the shear rate. That's called shear thinning. So that means the larger the speed of the slurry, the smaller the resistance against this speed. And our flow curve given in red, which is the shear stress in uh, relation to the shear rate, is changing its slope. Yeah? The slope of this flow curve is exactly the dynamic shear viscosity according to Newton's law. But now you see by dropping uh, the shear viscosity, the slope of our flow curve is also getting smaller, but 
the absolute value of the stress is still increasing. It's important because to increase the speed, you still need higher forces. But the ratio between the change in shear rate and the change in shear stress is changing. So now we are close to uh, finishing our measurement. We can have a look how accurate the data are by monitoring the steady state. I will just show this quickly in the software. And the value equal of one indicates that you have measured correctly. And as can be seen, for all the shear rates we have applied, we are close to the value of one. Now, another important flow property of battery slurries is their elasticity. And while we are measuring the shear viscosity, there is also a measurement of the elasticity possible by means of our normal force sensor. This is coming from the well-known Weissenberg effect. A viscoelastic sample tries to push the upper cone upwards, but we have a constant gap size, so we measure a positive normal force if the sample responds elastic, partly elastic, aside of its uh, flow behavior, the shear viscosity curve. So now if we plot the normal force in addition to our shear viscosity, then you see an interesting effect that at low shears our normal force is close to zero, as having said that before in the thermal equilibrium uh, period, the surface tension tries to drag the upper cone down, but now if we are approaching higher shear rates, you see there's an increase in normal force while the viscosity is going down. So it's quite the opposite effect. And that's interesting because elasticity and viscosity are acting against each other. Elasticity wants to store energy, viscosity wants to dissipate energy, and at a certain critical shear rate, the elasticity can get dominated across uh, the shear rate range. And this is done by normalizing the normal force with the surface area of our geometry. It's called normal stress. And we plot that finally onto our shear stress axis to compare how much force do I need to overcome the viscous resistance in shear flow and how much elasticity at the same shear rate is uh, arising in the material. This is called normal stress. And we calculate uh, the hydrostatic pressure and move it out of the uh, normal stress. So therefore it's called normal stress difference. You see from the purple curve here that at the critical shear rate of approximately 40 reciprocal seconds, the normal stresses are getting higher than the shear stresses. So from that shear rate onwards, elasticity dominates the shear flow versus the entirely viscous response. So it's getting more critical. I don't want to say you cannot process your slurry at high shear rates, but you need to be careful. Yeah? Always monitor the viscosity, but also the elasticity in a flow curve measurement. So now that's all. We can save the data, clean the rheometer, and start the next measurement.